Right. Uh, so Kaylee Rockcliffe is a PhD candidate at Dartmouth College, where she studies exoplanet atmospheres with Dr. Elizabeth Newton. Uh, beyond her work studying exoplanet atmosphere escape, which we'll hear about uh, in today's talk, Kaylee is also a master at curating excellent Spotify playlists. So any questions on that, be sure to ask. But I will turn it over to you, Kaylee. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that. You stole my introductory slide. <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone, for being here today and being um, online. Uh, as Joe said, my name is Kaylee Rockcliffe, and I'm a fifth-year PhD student, um, and I'm working for Dr. Elizabeth Newton. She's an extremely great advisor, scientist, collaborator, so 10 out of 10 would recommend you uh, reach out to her if you want to do some awesome science. Um, but today, I'll be talking about a certain hot-headed, hot Neptune, AU McB. But before I do that, I just want to begin by thanking all of my collaborators. A special thank you to Dr. Allison Youngblood, who's in the room with us today and who invited me here. Um, she's an especially great scientist and has been an amazing support to me, and in, in particular, this work, which we just submitted to the AAS journals last week. So, without further ado, let's start talking about AU McB and its atmosphere. All right. So because of the diligence of planet hunters, the observed and characterized exoplanet population has grown into the thousands. So enough for some really significant population level patterns to emerge. So here we have exoplanet radius on the Y and exoplanet period on the X axis. And it has changed over the course of exoplanet discovery. So one such pattern is now seen called the hot Neptune desert and then this also savanna area. It refers to the lack of planets around short orbital periods that are also Neptune sized. And this is predicted and thought to be explained by the evolutionary process called atmospheric escape. Another way to look at this is through the distribution of exoplanet radii. So here we've got exoplanet radii decreasing as you go to the right. And I'm gonna flip it. So the thought is that exoplanets can be born as rocky cores with these large gaseous, en gaseous envelopes um, around the size of Saturn, um, a little bit smaller than Jupiter, Neptune sized, et cetera. Um, but mass loss has these atmospheres being lost over time, and then they end up populating the two peaks at lower radii. So we've got these sub-Neptune, mini-Neptune type planets that might be rocky cores with smaller gaseous envelopes. And then we've also got a peak at super Earth size where there might be bare rocky cores. Um, we still don't know. Uh, hopefully JWST will be able to answer some of the questions about these smaller planets. Um, but let's get into atmospheric escape. A planet can lose bits of its atmosphere in a variety of different ways. Genes escape is a type of thermal atmospheric escape. Um, in this case, particles that are in the upper atmosphere. So like, and when I say upper atmosphere, I mean the highest altitudes of a planet's atmosphere. I don't just mean like the base of the thermosphere or anything like that, which planetary people might really care about um, and which are still very important. But we're talking about the tippity tippity top. So up at the top, some of the particles are, can be described by a Maxwellian distribution in speed. Um, and for genes escape, these, uh, some particles at the edges of this distribution have such high velocities that they exceed the escape velocity of the planet, and so they're able to escape the planet. And this is thought to be a particular driver for atmospheric escape on hot Jupiters. So if you're looking at hot Jupiter atmospheric escape, genes escape is likely the mechanism, or thought to be the likely mechanism that is driving that. There are also non-thermal versions of atmospheric escape, like polar wind escape. Um, and this happens on planets that have magnetospheres. So you've got your open, open magnetic field lines, and the ions around the poles are able to follow those field lines out of the atmosphere. Um, but this is just assuming that a planet will have a magnetosphere to begin with. And there are several other different types of escape, many of which might actually be occurring at the same time. Earth undergoes several different versions of atmospheric escape. It's just that we're very lucky that we have an atmosphere that isn't being lost so quickly, and we also have outgassing processes that we're able to hold on something that gives us life. Um, but the uh, atmospheric escape process thought to be the most influential on exoplanets is hydrodynamic escape. 
It's a thermal version of atmospheric escape, and it occurs when the upper atmosphere globally is heated, um, and that causes a bulk outflow um, off of the planet. And this makes the mass loss rate, so the, the amount of mass that's lost over a small bit of time, very, very high. Digging even deeper, hydrodynamic escape can be caused by photoevaporation. So this is an external atmospheric escape driver. This is when the irradiation from the planet heats the upper atmosphere. And for the majority of this talk, I'll be using this photoevaporation regime. But that's not to ignore the fact that hydrodynamic escape can also be powered by the cooling core of a young exoplanet. So the cooling core releases radiation, and that heats the atmosphere from the bottom. So here we have our first question. Um, if atmospheric escape shapes the exoplanet population, what primarily is driving it? Is it photoevaporation? Is it core-powered mass loss? Is it something else? Is it not atmospheric escape at all? Is it exoplanet formation that just leaves these imprints on demographics? Um, and in order to explore this question, we need to go out and find observations. And that's why we have um, our kind of landmark atmospheric escape observation of Gliese 436 and its hot Neptune Gliese 436b. Um, like I said, it's kind of the landmark atmospheric escape observation for the field and has been used to help develop observation strategies for other planets. But as we'll see, this, might, this may be a special case and not something that is indicative of the entirety of the population. But before I get into that, I just want to give a primer on how we get those observations. So how do we actually observe atmospheric escape? So let's look at Gliese 436b this way. Because we know the period and the epoch of the mid-transit of the planet pretty well, we can predict when the planet will be transiting in front of Gliese 436. And then at different points of the transit, the star's light will be interacting with the different parts of the atmosphere. So you've got like opaque large cloud and different parts of the lower atmosphere, which might have different compositions and interact with different parts of the spectrum in different ways. So we want to point Hubble or JWST or other capable observatories at this planet over the course of the transit to capture the light, how the light changes, and then those imprints will give us information on the intervening material. And the majority of upper atmospheres are assumed to be neutral hydrogen. Um, this is just thought to be the, what composes the highest altitude parts of the atmosphere, and the region of the stellar spectrum with which neutral hydrogen interacts the most is Lyman alpha. And so for the majority of this, well, for the entirety of this talk, I will be talking strictly about the Lyman alpha emission line from the star, which is in the ultraviolet. So here we have the baseline Lyman alpha spectrum of Gliese 436. So this hatch center is completely absorbed by neutral hydrogen in the interstellar medium. So like if there was no interstellar medium, you'd see this big, big peaked line, um, potentially double peaked, depending on the star and depending on who you're talking to. Um, but the middle is completely absorbed because we're unlucky and we're surrounded by lots of cold neutral hydrogen. Um, but the wings are luckily observable. And on this blue side, the baseline is highlighted by this wonky little yellow line that I added. But when the planetary outflow transits in front of the star, it absorbs part of the Lyman alpha flux. So here we've got a dip in the blue wing that causes um, the Lyman alpha flux. That is, the Lyman alpha flux is being absorbed um, by the intervening planetary outflow. And because it's in the blue wing and we're not seeing some equally significant dip in the red wing, we believe that the cloud of the outflow is mostly moving away from the host star towards us as the observer. Um, and then we can integrate over these regions in and plot it over time, and that's how you create your light curve, which I've plotted here, or not I've plotted, David Ironwright plotted on the right um, it's a nice little light curve. This is just for the blue wing, and it shows a pretty nice 50% dip because of this uh, tail that's transiting in front of the star. And if you're fancy, you can fit these light curves with weird shapes that are not just opaque circles, and you can learn stuff about the outflow's geometry. Um, but in conclusion, those are just the like, basics of observing atmospheric escape. However, um, 
our landmark system, for Gliza 436, is over a gig a year old. It's a field age system. So, and if we think about atmospheric escape theoretically, um, even driven by slower mass loss processes, this system or this planet should not have an atmosphere at this point in time. So it should have already lost its atmosphere by now if it was experiencing atmospheric escape over the course of its short, uh, over the course of its lifetime as a short period exoplanet. But Bourier et al. 2018 measured the orbital properties of Gliese 436b and found that the planet is likely on a pol polar orbit. So um, if we look here, the star's pole is sort of pointed at us, and then the planet will end up transiting over the pole of the star. And in order to get an orbital structure like this, you really need uh, gravitational perturbation from some outside um, perturber that causes a planet that's at larger distances from the star to migrate inwards, so like COSI migration. Um, and so it is likely that Gliese 436b formed farther out from the star, far enough that it healthily held on to its atmosphere. It was nice and having a good time and sitting out there. And then it was perturbed by some uh, third party. Uh, we, we have no observations of the third party yet, but um, this is like what would recreate this uh, orbital structure. And so it started to migrate inwards, and as it migrated inwards later in life, it started to lose its atmosphere, and that's why we can see it at over a giga year old. So this brings us to our second question. When do planets lose their atmospheres? Is a system architecture like Gliese 436 common enough to cause the patterns we see like the hot Neptune desert or like the radius gap? Um, and if that's the case, what about the young, highly irradiated gaseous planets? And to investigate this, we want to search and look at those young, highly irradiated gaseous planets. So we did that, as did several other groups. The light curve on the right shows the search for atmospheric escape around the young K225b, which is a young hot Neptune, basically approaching it with the same um, approach that Gliese 436b had. We're looking at Hubble stiff spectra of the Lyman Alpha line um, over time and the top panel is the blue wing, the bottom panel is the red wing. The only thing you really need to care about here is that we don't see any transit at all. So we're not detecting any planetary tail of Gliese, uh, not of Gliese, of K225b, unlike the very obvious and very repeatable tail of Gliese 436b. And the same can be said for the search for atmospheric escape around the young HD 63433b, which was done by Michael Zhang. Um, and is shown by their similar uh, light curve on the right. This is just for the blue wing. The yellow line shows like the predicted transit um, shape if there was outflow of neutral hydrogen, but as you can see, the observations in yellow and in blue do not line up with that. Um, and it turns out James Owen, Ruth Murray Clay, and collaborators came out with a framework earlier this year that sort of explains these non-detections as the result of the outflow being mostly ionized by its high energy irradiation. So the young star that it is orbiting emits heavily in the X-ray and the EUV, which interacts with the neutral hydrogen and ionizes it and makes it basically invisible to Lyman alpha. So it is there, but it is highly ionized its protons, and so we can't see it. So here we have our last question. If we need to observe atmospheric escape in young systems to further constrain how it impacts exoplanet evolution, but these young systems kind of preferentially fall into this photoionization uh, framework, can we still learn from Lyman alpha transits of young planets? And this is for people who are potentially on Hubble proposal tax. Um, I'll aim to answer that one question by the end of this talk. The first two are for us to come together as a community and answer together with more telescope time. So enter the infamous Eumic, a nearby pre-main sequence star that can kind of throw a bit of a tantrum um, and is well known for that. It is 22 million years old um, and it is orbited by at least two companions, Eumic B and C. The talk that I'm giving today is ev everything is on observations of Eumic B, and but we did check and that AUMIC-C is not transiting during any of our observations. 
You just had to do that because AUMXC was discovered after these observations were taken. So just want to double check that we're not double observing this system. All right, so AUMXB sits on the edge of the hot Neptune desert slash savanna. It's similar in size to Gliese 436b, but it does orbit slightly farther out. Um, likely because the star is so variable and so much younger than Gliese 436, uh, that more than makes up for this difference in orbital separation. Um, so if you think of how that translates to irradiation of the planet. So we asked for two visits of six orbits each with Hubble's STIS spectra, um, which captures the Lyman Alpha line. And these spectra are shown here. Um, and we have one archival visit from the late 90s, which is great, um, that, so that we can compare all three together. Um, the, the archival visit does not coincide with any planetary transit at all, so we can kind of use it as a baseline. So the center, as per usual for these not high radial velocity systems, is almost completely absorbed by the ISM. Um, and then you might see residual bumps in the middle, and that's due to systematic failure to absorb uh, all of the geochronal emissions, so the, the Lyman alpha light that's reflected off of the Earth's atmosphere and observed by Hubble. And then this deuterium bump that is shown right here, that's very much expected. Um, this is because of the deuterium within the interstellar medium, so it absorbs a bit outside the core of Lyman alpha and causes this little dip. So that is, that is not the planet. All right, then there are what I'm going to refer to as the extended wings. So your farthest blue and your farthest red pieces of the Lyman alpha spectrum. And over the course of all of the visits and all of the orbits, we don't see this part of the spectrum varying much at all. So we think that the majority of the planetary material will actually be seen in these light gray shaded regions. Um, so the inner red wing, if we look between the, the visits, so this part of the September visit, the visit one right over here, and then the visit two right over here, um, we believe that this is not showing much variation at all, but it is showing enough that maybe if we just saw visit one and visit two, we think maybe that's a planetary transit. But because we see similar variation in a visit in the archival data um, that doesn't coincide with a planetary transit, this might just be some stochastic stellar or systematic noise. Um, so we're not able to definitively say, hey, this is a planet. So just to be safe, we're gonna say, hey, this might just be noise. But if you look at the inner blue wing, you can see that the archival data and even the visit one data show basically no change above noise level um, in the blue wing at all. But then if you look at visit two, you've got this stark increase in flux over the course of the visit. So this low blue wing flux in this first orbit of the visit all the way up to the highest flux at the last orbit of the visit. And these gray regions are what we integrate to create our light curves. But before we look into trying to find planetary material, we just want to make sure we're recognizing and removing any potential stellar contamination. So even though this didn't show up in the Lyman Alpha spectra from before, um, there is actually a flare within the first orbit of visit one. Um, it's just so short that the Lyman Alpha full exposure averaged it out and washed it out in our spectrum. But um, it's relatively quick. And we were able to fit it using Adina Feinstein's uh, flare fitting code, um, cost flares. You can find that at her GitHub. Um, and what we really wanted to do with this, and you could definitely do more with flares. We're not flare people, so we were just kind of looking at how it would impact our ability to detect a planet. Um, so what we did was, with this fit to our Lyman Alpha flare, um, so just looking at the flare in Lyman Alpha, we wanted to see how long the flux increase would be a, able to wash out a 10%-ish planetary transit. And it turns out that the flare only lasts about 1.6 hours in terms of doing that, and that's basically only one HST orbit. And since this flare occurred almost seven hours before the mid-transit time of the planet, and it only lasts for like that short period of time, we don't think it will be washing out a planetary signal. That being said, though, the 
chemical impact of the flare is definitely something that can still leave an impact. Um, so just we're just here talking about the flux change not having an impact. Um, stick around for the uh, photoionization discussion. So here we have the lamin alpha blue wing on the top and red wing on the bottom light curves um, across all the AUMIC visits. Um, and this kind of reiterates what we were talking about before when looking at the spectra. But I'm going to break it down into chunks because that's how my brain works and hopefully yours does too. Um, so this is the archival visit. The blue wing is pretty flat, um, and the red wing does show that 10% change in flux, but we know that this did not occur during a planetary transit. And for our first visit, when we add it to the picture, the red wing again shows some 10% fluctuation, and at this point, this behavior is looking like it might be related to stellar activity or some stochastic systematic issue with HSP. Um, and then the blue wing is showing some strange increase in flux, um, but basically, I mean, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what would be causing an increase in the blue wing and a decrease in the red wing, um, but for now, we'll just say that is a non-detection of a planet because it's definitely not a transiting um, light curve. So before we add in the visit two to complete the picture, let's break down what could be causing no detection of atmospheric escape in this first visit. So the first question, do we even know if AUMIC-B is losing mass? Like, do we expect to see it? Theoretically, the people who proposed for this data already answered this question. They definitely did, but I just want to make sure we're covering all of our bases here. Um, so the, what we want to do is calculate the AUMIC-B mass loss rate and make sure it's high enough that we expect it to be observable. So if we assume energy limited mass loss, um, which is a safe assumption in the case of AUMIC-B's mass and its irradiation zone, um, we can get a range for the mass loss rate on the order of 10 to the 10 grams per second. Um, and I calculated it for the entirety of the, the entire range of mass measurements for AUMIC-B. Um, and it doesn't really impact the order much, it just impacts the, the factor in, in front. Um, but what's important here is the 10 to the 10 grams per second. All you really need to know there is that that's of the same order as calculated for planets with very obvious atmospheric escape that is observed. So if we believe this calculation and we think that the atmosphere is made up of neutral, neutral hydrogen, we should actually be seeing it in transit, but we're not. So that brings us to the second question, is it actually neutral hydrogen? How does photoionization balance recombination within this upper atmosphere? So we calculated the recombination time scale of the outflow given um, the mass loss rate from before. We conserve mass. We grab a density that is in the upper atmosphere, and we're able to calculate some estimated recombination time scale. And then we do a photoionization time scale estimate given observations of AUMIC during quiescence and during a flare um, that were observed with ROSAT in the early 2000s. The reason why we need those observations is because even though we have these nice spectra from STIS, that's only the far ultraviolet, and in order to get photoionization, you really need the spectrum from the extreme ultraviolet and the X-rays. So that's why we looked for archival observations of ROSAT. And these, are, these two timescales are basically of the same order. Um, so we can't really say definitively if one is going to dominate the other, especially given the visit one also had a flare that was happening. So potentially if this was an extremely energetic flare in the EUV and the X-ray, that might have lasted longer than the FUV um, flare did, and it could potentially just prevent recombination from happening in time for our transit of visit one. So at least partially, this might be what's going on. And this is my first plug for modelers or people who know modelers to like try and explain these observations given their cool, sophisticated models. But what else could explain a non-detection? So um, we've got people who use hydrodynamic models to show how the stellar wind impacts planetary outflows. Here we've got Carolan et al. 2020 who use different stellar wind, uh, stellar wind environments to see how it impacts planetary outflows. And the way that they characterize stellar wind environment is by the stellar mass loss rate, 
which you can see in the bottom left corner of these different panels. So we go from something that is like free flowing without any stellar um, mass loss, so no stellar wind, to something that's mostly solar, all the way to this extreme case of 1,000 solar mass loss rates. Um, and in that extreme case, we see a very confined planetary outflow, so confined that it would not be observed in transit. So this could explain the fact that we don't detect a transit. The only thing is um, this 1,000 solar mass loss rate is um, not something that is indicated by observations of M-dwarf stellar mass loss rates. Um, stellar mass loss rates for M-dwarfs are still largely unconstrained, but the observations that we do have don't indicate things to this extreme extent. Um, but that being said, that's kind of me asking the M-dwarf people to uh, make more observations of stellar wind mass loss rates. So like with photoionization, this stellar wind is a maybe. But let's come back to the full picture and include visit two. So we've got this red wing again showing a 10% dip. We're just gonna say that it's stellar or systematic because we see it across all three visits and we can't say one way or the other if it's planetary. But this blue wing, however, is highly suspect. So we see a very large dip, um, but it's happening before the white light transit given by this gray region. Um, so what we're, we're trying to think what could explain going from completely not detected in visit one to very detected in visit two, and not only very detected, but detected before the white light transit, so ahead of the planet. Something's hanging out in front of it. Um, and this is something that hasn't been seen before, at least to this extent and this magnitude. So Cohen et al. Um, in 2022 used MHD simulation, so they assume AUMIC-B has a magnetosphere. Um, so they simulate AUMIC-B's Lyman Alpha transit over very short time scales as they move AUMIC-B through a changing stellar wind environment much like the Earth moves through different solar wind environments because the sun is rotating, so the Earth is going through these different arms of solar wind speeds. Um, they did the same thing with AUMIC-B, um, and these cases kind of describe the different stellar wind environments. So case one is cell ball phanic speed uh, st solar wind, stellar winds. Um, case two is super alphanic, and then back to sub for case three. Basically, all you want to know here is that it's going through changing uh, stellar wind environments over orbit timescales. So these planets are orbiting on the order of days. So these timescales, it can change like within a day what the planet is experiencing. Um, so this is the change to the Lyman Alpha uh, spectrum on the left, but this is the change. This is what the kind of the meat of the paper on the right is the light curve. Um, you can see these very drastic changes in the light curve based on the different stellar wind environments. Um, and that's great because, you know, it's good to know that our Lyman Alpha transits are expected to change within the same system. Um, so we shouldn't always just be seeing something so repeatable, um, like something that re is recreating the Gliese 436b transit is not expected. That is actually a special system. Um, the thing that isn't so great about this is that it doesn't explain the going completely undetected, so like a flat line up here, and it also doesn't explain such a pre-transit transit. transit. Um, so you, as you can see, most of the outflows that they model are still around the center of transit that is expected. So that's why we move on to McCann et al. 2019's simulated work. Um, they also looked at stellar wind environments and they played with different stellar wind strength regimes. They defined stellar wind strength by um, basically the ram pressure of the stellar wind, um, and they quantify it in their weak, intermediate, and strong regimes. Um, and I encourage you to read their paper because it's very thorough. Um, the weak stellar wind regime all the way on the left is, um, it basically just allows the planetary outflow to spread across the entire orbit of the planet. So it might even in some cases form a ring, like a torus around the, uh, the, the star, um, which would have no transit at all. Um, and then the strong regime kind of shows this comet-like tail that we associate with Gliese 436b and other more um, expected uh, atmospheric escape observations. But I want to draw attention to this cool intermediate regime 
um, this regime is special because the stellar wind interplay with the planetary wind um, causes some instabilities that make this, this whole structure time variable, um, which can explain the fact that our visits show different Lyman alpha transits. Um, but I think the best way to view this is via video. Thank you, John McCann, for including videos. Um, so as you can see in the intermediate case, again, on the right, um, the planetary outflow can go from small and undetectable to extended and very much detectable and also ahead of the planet. So this is something that can explain the fact that our visit to looks so wonky. And this is great because this is the first time we've got observational evidence of this phenomenon. So I'm going to conclude with just these three kind of simple takeaways from our paper. We do see variable outflow from AUMIC-B. This is the first time a Lyman alpha transit has gone from not detected to detected um, in such a, a strong way. Um, it is also the first time we see a very deep leading tail to this magnitude. Um, sometimes we see little bits of leading, um, uh, leading outflows for, say, like Gliese 436b, but it's not something that is like an arm. It's more like a highly extended cloud. Um, and then also, and potentially kind of the most interesting part of this uh, work is that because we are able to see such weird things happening with this young system, um, we can now place constraints on the stellar environment of the planet. So using these wonky Lyman alpha transits, we're able to say that the planet is likely within this intermediate stellar wind strength regime. And with an increased modeling, we can potentially say more about that. So I encourage you to keep an eye out for the paper. Um, and thank you. I'll be around um, for the next week or so. If you have any questions, um, you can go to that room in this building, or you can email me at that wordvomit at dartmouth.edu. Thank you. Uh, so if anyone online has any questions for Kaylee, feel free to raise your hand or you can post them in chat. Also, if anyone in the room has a question, feel free to raise your hand. Um, I think I'll start uh, I, kind of like at the very end of what you were saying on the last slide. Um, is there a chance that the stellar wind environment changed in between visit one or two? I don't know if that's what you were, you were indicating with that last, yeah, but. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, this is just kind of getting at the beginning stages of characterizing stellar wind environments for these planets. Um, there, there are so many unknowns and I think it'll just involve heavy modeling. And if people want to investigate that further, they probably have to ask for a lot of HST time over like a short, like visit, um, which is probably not something that uh, TAC will award, but it would be super cool to see um, because we don't have much measurements of stellar wind properties on these systems. All right, I think there's a couple of questions online. Uh, Tom, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so obviously this is, this is looking at Lyman Alpha, which is um, the best case, but th there's some UV surveys potentially upcoming from space, one is Ultrasat, which is, I think, looking at like 290 nanometers, and potentially UVEX, which is, um, will also do UV surveys. So can you learn anything from UV time series, kind of wide area surveys that aren't in Lyman Alpha? Um, well, not off the top of my head, I don't know which lines would be included. Is this a spectra time series? No, it's, 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 it's basically think tests in space, tests in oh. UV, kind gotcha. of. Probably not then. Um, there are, uh, there is work that's being done to look at um, the, these like transits in metal lines. Um, and those can be seen across the UV spectrum, but they're probably washed out by the continuum behavior. Okay, thank you. All right, and there's a question in chat. It says, uh, coming from a stellar modeling perspective, do you think that the morphology of the escaping atmosphere 
<clears throat> could be used to place constraints on the stellar mass loss rates for higher mass stars. Uh, for example, if you were to look at planets in the orbit of O or, o or B stars. <laughs> That's okay. Um, okay, cool. Higher mass stars, I basically never think about them. Um, I think, well, we don't have many of those stars, if any, off the top of my head that have planets that are orbiting them. Um, the majority of everything that we see in terms of exoplanets are around lower mass stars. Um, that being said, if you do get a very high mass planet that is orbiting pretty close to its high mass star, you will get some mass loss rate intermingling that could definitely place some constraints if you use your magnetohydrodynamic models. You'd have to make a lot of assumptions, but we all do that. So I'm, I'm, it could be possible, but you'd need to find the system. All right. Does anyone else? Yes. I, I have a question, but because I'm not very familiar with your topic, I'm from microlensing, basically. Um, so with microlensing, usually we detect a planet, and then like maybe five, ten years after we go follow up and maybe these follow ups are like one year after each other more or less. But with transit things like it's so fast, I imagine like you can do those visits faster. Usually um what is the ideal interval? Like do you wait a year or do you try to observe like twice a year and how many times do you think like it's enough to really like have a more solid like conclusion? Uh, yeah, that's really great. Um, with like photometric observations where we actually detect the transits, we're able to catch these very quickly. So something like TESS can observe these day periods pretty easily since it's a, just pointed for a long period of time in relation to the, the period of the planet. So it's able to just see it. Um, with Hubble, which is where we're trying to find this atmospheric escape, um, it's harder because we, one, are competing for Hubble time, and we, we need it pointed at a specific system, and we need it taken over a certain um, like observational plan around the transit, and usually we are beholden to the um, scheduling system within the Hubble's, uh, within Hubble's um, administration. So uh, I've only seen maybe two visits. Like, I don't think I've ever seen three visits awarded to an atmospheric escape proposal, and that would be three visits spread over the course of a year. Um, so we wouldn't, it would be difficult to get a back-to-back, -back, um, which that would be nice. It would be nice to get a back-to-back -back, uh, visit because um, we could get at something like what Joe was saying earlier about how um, maybe the stellar wind is just changing a lot between the visits, and that could explain the difference in transit. Um, another thing would be able to, if we were able to get more visits, we'd be able to confirm. And so something that I'd like is probably another uh, Hubble program looking at AUMIC-B to really definitively say whether or not um, this signal is repeatable or not. And if it would be really nice if there just wasn't a flare. <laughs> like flares just, just make life a lot harder because they introduce that photoionization um, parameter. Uh, but yeah. All right, does anyone else have any other questions in the room or online? Okay, well, I think we will end it there, but Kaylee, you said you're around for a little bit, so if anyone wants to meet with Kaylee, definitely get in touch. And thank you again, a great talk. Let's thank our speaker again. All right, I will stop the online meeting here.